going on here with Kyle's deck. Um, so this is a pretty classic reanimator deck. He's got four in tomb, four careful study as ways to get uh, big creatures into his graveyard. And then his reanimation spells are four exhume, four reanimate, and two animate dead. And he has some disruption in the form of force of will and thought seize. The interesting thing to look at is his choice in creatures to reanimate. So he has three Gristlebrand, which has become the creature du jour to uh, cheat into play. But he also has an assortment of silver bullets. He's got one Iona Shield of Amaria, one Angel of Despair, one Elish Norn Grand Cenobite, one Jinnikataxius Core Augur, and one Sphinx of the Steel Wind. Okay, given his choice, his go-to card in this matchup would likely be, I would say, probably Iona, as it's a mono blue deck. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely the case if there is not an Aether Vial in play. The one issue is that if there is an Aether Vial in play, there's the danger of um, a Phantasmal Image being vialed in to kill a legend. So starting Kyle, uh, Kyle was on the, on the play, being the number four seed. He mulliganed to five this game. Chris, is on a, Chris has a seven card hand. Kyle with a turn one ponder. Granted, um, of all decks, you know, Reanimator can mull to five fairly well. Uh, he's kept a hand with an... It appears in Exhume. And a Brainstorm. And, and an Animate. I think animate it's an dead. Animate Dead. It must be an Animate Dead from the Graveborn uh, mm -hmm. special set. So the, the biggest thing, this will be a check on whether or not how many counter spells Chris Morris has, has kept. The thing is, because Kyle only has a five card hand, he doesn't really have much offensive counter magic. Um, he's going to try to, you know, if Chris has, say, a Daze, a Force, and a blue card, it's going to be really hard for Kyle yeah. to to establish his combo in time. And so we see in Chris's hand that he does have the daze. He also has a curse catcher, so it's kind of interesting that he led with Aether Vile and not the curse catcher. You know, I think on the five card hand, he probably felt that um, he wasn't he wasn't too worried about a turn two because he had the daze, and mm -hmm. the Aether Vile does, will probably speed him up a full turn over the course of this match. So yeah. he's maybe more worried about Kyle drawing cards to to win than the really fast kill. Um, and so one interesting thing that's happened here is that Chris now has the Aether Vial up to one. He's gonna be able to vial in the Curse Catcher as an uncounterable daze if he needs to. So there's there's the potential for surprise there. All right, so turn two, we have Lord of Atlantis coming down for Chris Morris. Uh, so that's the fir his first threat. You know, Kyle does have an island in play. Not that Kyle would really have too many blockers. It may matter because Kyle, when he reanimates, his creatures don't have haste. What will be of note is that on that turn, Kyle will not be able to block. Yeah, and so Kyle uh, appears to have drawn an Entomb for his turn. So he has the full combo of Entomb for a guy and then Exhume it um, in his hand. The question is, is he going to go for it? If he goes for it, is he going to do it all at once in this one turn? Or is he going to try to do it over two turns to play around days? Right, and he, so he's playing around... The card he's playing around is uh, Curse Catcher coming off the Ether Vial, Days, and Force of Will. He can't really play around the Force of Will, but he can he can play around the Days to a degree and play around the Curse Catcher yeah. to a degree. And if he wanted to play around Force of Will, he has a, a Brainstorm in his hand. He could try to find a Thought Seize, try to find a Force of Will to go with it. That doesn't seem like a really valid option. So he's going to go right? with a main phase in Tomb. Uh, I'm a little curious about the main phase option there. I think if you're doing it main phase, you're probably intending to just, just go for the whole thing. right there, right? Yeah, that seems a little... I mean, the reason I would be very scared of that is, remember, you know, top eight players have access to each other's deck lists, mm -hmm. and you have to think, you know, Chris kept his heaven. Um, there's got to be at least a curse catcher days or force in it. Yeah. You, know, you can't... You probably... Chris wouldn't keep a hand without at least one of those. That's, that's very true. And we see that Kyle entombs for a Sphinx of the Steel win here. Um, this, is, this is a choice that, as, you can, as we talked about a little bit before, is dependent on the fact that, he, that his opponent has an Aether Vial out and he's playing around his opponent having a Phantasm image to Legend Rule any um, of the legendary creatures that Kyle could put out, like Bristlebrand and most importantly like Iona, Shield of Ameria. Right, so we have Animate Dead. He's he's trying for the Animate Dead. He does have multiple. Like, when you think he's doing here is because he has multiple reanimation spells. His intention is to just kind of make reanimation spell after reanimation spell and hope one of them sticks. Yeah, uh, and so we see at the end of the turn that Chris Morris Lent vials in uh, the Curse Catcher. That's going to start to put a clock on Kyle. But now that it's out there, Kyle's going to be able to play around that appropriately. Uh, so if Chris has more disruption in his hand. That may uh, that may lead Kyle to overextending a little bit, but if he doesn't, Kyle may be able to 
reanimate his Sphinx and get there. All right, so we see a curse catcher coming down using Ether Vial for Chris Morris. Now he has, uh, he's gonna swing, he has four power in play, or seven power in play, four of it they're gonna swing this turn. This is probably all the clock he's really going to need in the matchup. Yep, and he drew a standstill uh, either this turn off of his draw step or off of the, uh, the Silver Guild adapting. He's gonna play it now, which means that when Kyle goes for it, he's going to get a chance to break that standstill, draw three cards, and have a good chance of finding a Force of Will or other Disruption spell. Yep. Uh, Kyle's going to go ahead and try for Exhum here. Um, this will break the standstill. Kyle drew a Gristlebrand for the turn, so not really a card. Uh, Phantasmal Image, Silver Girl Adept, and a land. So, so a break on the standstill for Chris. Yeah. So Chris is not going to be able to interfere with this, but there is a question here of, is the Sphinx going to be yeah, enough? enough. E even, if, even if Kyle resolves the Sphinx, uh, I believe there's a very good chance that Chris can race the Sphinx yeah. to the Steel Wind. Um, and the important thing here is that Lord of Atlantis gives all the other uh, merfolk island walk, but Chris Morris Lent also has uh, the M13 version of Lord of Atlantis. So next turn all the creatures will be able yeah. to swing. And Chris was pretty aware of the fact that he wasn't, you know, that he moved into race mode, he didn't use the Curse Catcher on the Exhum, he wanted to keep as much power as possible on the yeah. table. Uh, so, we expect the Master of the Pearl Trident in Chris Morris Lens hand to come down this turn, um, potentially with, you know, uh, if he's drawn any other two or three Mana Lords, that'll come down as well. And if that's the case, we could be looking at 10 to 13 damage coming down against Kyle. Okay, interestingly enough, um, so when I look at this, the Sphinx of the Steel Wind, you know, had Kyle chosen to entomb uh, Elish Norn instead in this situation, I think he'd be in a game-winning position. Well, he'd he'd be in a better position because he'd be able to wrath Chris's board, but the the phantasmal image in Chris's hand would take care of would it. have taken care of it, and Chris would have to rebuild. But he has the cards to rebuild it because of that exactly. standstill. I mean, right? So you're trying to wonder if any of the actual if any of the creatures actually would have been enough. Yeah. Um, so we see an attack for 10 here, I believe, with Lord of Atlantis, the Curse Catcher, and the Silver Guild Adept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, this is this matchup really tough for Reanimator. Not only does this Chris deck have all this counter magic and a good clock, on top of it, the phantasmal images are, fair, are quite impressive in the matchup. That's very true. And you can see that Chris has left his Aether Vial at 2. He may be trying to play around uh, Kyle getting down an Elish Norn or getting down some other legendary creature and being able to Aether Vile the Phantasmal Image right away uh, to Legend rule it out. Right, so we see three cards. Off the Drainstorm we see a careful study. He'll almost, he'll almost certainly put both the, Grin the Gristlebrand and the uh, Elish Norn back on top of this deck. You know, yeah. Those really don't belong in his hand in the matchup. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately the, the daze in his hand is virtually dead so he's going to have one clean draw off of this careful study to find something to save him here. I'm not sure if there are actually any outs for Kyle at this point. No, I mean, it, well, kind of as we went over before, even, even if Kyle could have a lot of the, the reanimation targets in play, um, not many of them actually win, this, win on this board state. Yeah, so perhaps if he had hit Angel of Despair there and a reanimation spell, ah, there, there just isn't, that, that's not going to be enough. And we did have a good point brought up on Twitter that uh, probably Chris Morris should have could have could have sacked his curse catcher and then got it back off the resolved exhum to tap Kyle out. Uh, as it turns out, uh, both plays kind of ended up the same way. Yep. So we see Chris Morris Lent vial in a phantasmal image, copy the Sphinx of the Steel Wind, and trade. Uh, so both players gain six life from that play, mm -hmm. um, and then the two creatures go away. Post combat, Kyle is brainstorming. He finds uh, yeah, not some sure irrelevant was, spells. Right. I mean, and, and that's I think one of the difficulties in the matchup is that, you know, his reanimation targets do not particularly win the game here. Yeah. So uh, post board. Before we do yeah. post board, let's come back to the booth. Sure. I want to talk a little bit about. So if you followed us early this morning, you would have known that during or pre at a previous Star City Open, you know that during the top eight, we do trivia questions for varying amounts, increasingly increasing amounts of uh, free Star City Premium. So the first question during the top eight is for three months of Star City Premium, and what do we have? So. Today, uh, this morning, we had a player who top eight of the standard, and then he almost made it to the top eight of Legacy, getting ninth on tiebreakers by right. less than 
two uh, percent of, uh, of, of the percentage point. Uh, that player is going to be doing commentary at GP Miami, a StarCityGames.com event. Um, for three months of StarCityGames.com premium, please name that player. Tweet your answer uh, with the hashtag SCG Premium, mm -hmm. uh, and we will select from among all the correct answers uh, one person randomly to get that three months free. All right. Once again, question. We're looking for the player who top aided the standard this morning and who <laughs> finished in ninth place on Breakers. We're looking for the the, the, the Miami commentator. Yeah. And if you want to find out a little bit more information about GP Miami, perhaps find the answer to this question, you can go ahead and check out magicgp.com, which has all the information about the standard event that's being run by StarCityGames.com uh, at the end of June, June 28th, 29th, and 30th. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the sideboards for these players. Um, I'd imagine that we're going to see Chris's deck get even better post-board uh, in this matchup. We have two Relic of Progenitus in the sideboard that are certainly going to be coming in. Absolutely. Do you think any of the other cards in here are going to be used? Well, he... I mean, because he knows that opponent, if he suspects Kyle will be on the show and tell plan, he could side in the Sower of Temptation, mm -hmm. and you know that seems like a a decent thing to be doing here. Outside of that, he has a he has Spell Pierce, which I think he would also board in in the matchup. None of the other cards. I'm not particularly excited about any of the other cards. He yeah. could board in, you know, Echoing Truth if he actually feels like if that you know bouncing one of those cards into you know if he feels like that. There are some of the targets, uh, which Kyle gets Echoing Truth a good answer to. Obviously, things like Iona, that doesn't really help. Yeah. And so the two dismembers that Chris has in his main deck seem like pretty obvious cards to take out. Absolutely. After that, maybe we're shaving a Merfolk Regery or two in order to fit these cards in. Yeah, Merfolk Regery's a little expensive. All, all Chris really needs, he doesn't need the clock, that it, you know, the extra clock there. All Chris really needs to get down is you know, about two, two, three creatures, and that should be... An appropriate clock yeah. for the matchup. And the Master of the Pearl Trident and the Lord of Atlantis are the best lords for this matchup because yeah. they grant evasion and bypass some of Chris's things like the lifelink on the Sphinx of the Steel Wind. Mm -hmm. uh, so taking a look at Kyle's sideboard, his, his is much more streamlined. He's got the three Piffing Needles, the one Cyclonic Rift, Rift, the three Echoing Truth, the two Spell Pierce, the three Surgical Extraction, and the three Show and Tell. Um, if he suspects that Chris has a lot of uh, a lot of graveyard hate, he'll bring in the show and tells. Um, he could also decide to bring in the pithing needles um, if he thinks that all of Chris's hate is Relic of Progenitus or Tormod's Crypt. The problem is that he's playing a guessing game here about what kind of hate that Chris has. Um, and that's a really hard place to be when you're down a game going into game two. Uh, in the dark, do you, what would you bring in here? Well, I mean, so the question is if he's on the show and tell plan, if he if he wants to try to put it together that way. I, I don't really see a reason for him to do it too much. And he maybe he it would be playing around, you know, the relic of the two relic of progenitus, but that is only two cards. Mm -hmm. Um, so I yeah, I in that point, I I think he's mostly still on his main deck. To be honest, yeah. I don't see too many things that that he'd run or board in. I th I think I agree with you that. You know, he wants to be reactive with his choice of Pithing Needle and Show and Tell. He doesn't want to, wa want to water down his deck. Maybe he considers bringing in the Spell Pierces because he needs to win the counter war. But that said, like, you know, he, he can't really afford to cut down that much on what's going on in his main deck. He mm -hmm. needs to have a fast draw in order to get there. And because the counter war always happens when Kyle's casting a spell, cards like, you know, Spell Pierce become a little less good. Yeah. Uh, so I hear that we have some updates on the other brackets. Yep, our top eight moving pretty quickly. Uh, we have actually, so David Dobarn, our one seed with Dark Maverick, does take the first game from Blue Light Red Miracles. Remember, that's our other match, and that'll be playing the winner of this match. Uh, other winners are Brian, Brian Hawley, up one game to zero over Benjamin Wheeler. And we have Daniel Wynn winning the first game over Brian Elliott. Okay. In some way, I, I kind of think that all three of those may be upsets. Um, I, I definitely think that... You know, we like Hive Mind a little bit more than Elves. You know, this isn't a huge upset, but maybe a 55-45. Yeah, Bant beating Rug Delver is definitely surprising to me, as is Maverick being up on Miracles. Yeah, we, we definitely felt that Miracles was was strongly advantaged in that game. So it'll be interesting to find out what happened, and maybe we'll be able to check, get a look at one of those matches if they go to a Game 3. 
Uh, but meantime, in our feature match, we have finished shuffling up and both players are about to draw their seven card hand. All right, so Kyle will be on the play uh will be on the play again. Remember, last time he was on a five-card hand, and with reanimator, especially in a matchup like this, it's it, the first two turns often are dictate the entire game. Um, and in that game, Chris was able to fully utilize his entire hand, um, and while Kyle had a fairly quick draw, given that he had five cards, he didn't have the disruption to fight through Chris's disruption. So it looks like we're both keeping our seven card hands. Kyle's leading with a polluted delta, and I'd imagine that he's gonna be casting one of the two brainstorms in his hand. Yep. So keeping so one of the questions is, you know, the one of the best ways for Kyle to play around Chris's counter, Chris's disruption, is to, you know, really attempt to combo before Chris has any before Chris can play lands. Before Chris can play, you know, before like before Chris can do much. Yeah. Um he has bored into the show and tell package. So, and so he's going to fetch for a basic swamp. That's interesting. So I saw a re reanimate in two brainstorms and another land in a hand. I this think this is either in tomb or thought sees, right? Yeah, and I don't believe he's. I don't believe he. Or he has two thought sees in the main. So yeah, it could be any of those. Um, and obviously, in tomb is more likely given that there are four of them, um, and he does have an in tomb in his hand. He has two reanimates. Brain, two, uh, brainstorms. two brainstorms and entomb and a fetch land. Right, so so that does the entomb does resolve. Kyle probably has to like where this is right now. Uh, he you know he will be able to um, try for a reanimate with Day's mana up twice. Yep, uh, and he goes ahead and tombs the Iona Shield of Ameria. Uh, if he manages to get that down on a stable board state, uh, he, wins. he wins. So I mean I, I think when you're going for a really fast a turn two reanimation, this is the clear target to get. Yeah. Um, and even like if the nightmare scenario exists of Chris playing a turn one ether vial, um, that Iona is going to be able to get in at least one hit, and it's going to give Kyle some time to cast some spells without the threat of Chris being able to counter them. Mm -hmm. So it does appear that he has a couple of ether vials, and Mutavault, at least one basic island. Looks like a couple of dazes. Right, so the tricky part here is that if Kyle, when Kyle goes for the combo uh, this next turn, he'll be able to pay for the days, and because Chris doesn't have two mana to cast days, uh, this probably will resolve. Yeah. So like I said, interesting in this matchup, when I said like the entire game is often determined on the first two turns. So we see a fetch land from Kyle. Chris says, yep, you're, I am not going to go ahead and stifle your uh, activation. I believe he doesn't have any stifles in his list. Uh, we get a underground C from that, and Kyle's going to pull the trigger and attempt to reanimate. Um, and because reanimate costs just one black mana, um, he's going to be able to pay for a daze. All right. So, and I, if we see Chris's hand correctly, I don't think Chris is going to have a, be able to have a response to this. Interestingly enough, when Chris is on the draw, the only cards that really matter are Days and Force of Will, and possibly Curse Catcher. Yep. Um, other cards in his hand. You know, Relic of Progenitus becomes a card when Chris is on the play because then he'll have it in time to activate the relic. Yeah, but if it's it, unless we have some sort of situation, no. The, even then, there, there's no there's no time that the tap ability of Relic of Progenitus is going right, to right because when he puts the turn one creature in the yard, they'll already be an entomb there to shield whatever monster yeah. he's getting. So reanimate has been declared. Chris is looking at the two days in his hand and he's saying. This isn't enough. I need a second island. So, the, I, th I think it's, I think it's fair to say this is the one, the only decks, graveyard decks against which I find that like Relic of Progenitus can be a little underwhelming, where you'd prefer it to be Tormod's Crypt. <laughs> Typically, people play Relic because you know it cycles. It's yep. it's almost all, it, it's often a better card. And it's it's often you know very good for slowly working down a graveyard so that you get multiple uses out of it. Right. Um, sometimes people bring it in against Karmagoyfs because it's able to control them, much like a Deathrite Shaman is able to do some in those sorts of John Muir matches. Chris decides to continue playing. I'm not positive. See, Iona, Iona's naming blue. Um, <laughs> How I'm not positive. If he's kept in his dismembers, he could be hoping to draw to a double dismember hand. Double dismember to try to get it? Yeah, that seems pretty rough. Um, one thing that... I'm trying to think if he has an out. Kind of question is he he chose not to play the ether vial on his turn one I guess to represent spell pierce um, and so now he's playing 
the two of them here. Right. Iona's going to attack him for seven. Yeah. There's going to a counter going to go on to the vial. Then Iona's going to attack him for another seven. The second counter is going to go on to the vial. So he has time to draw a phantasmal image to legend rule Iona. Right. And that's cool. Yeah, he's going to use the ether vials to get around Iona's ability. Uh, we do see that that's a daze being picked up on the second ether vial, which yeah. is a little puzzling. I think the, the first ether vial, you know, you either let him have none or both. Well, so the reason for this is that if Kyle... I, 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 guess I, I don't think it's super solid spells. reasoning, but I, I think the, the reason that he is doing that is that he um, wants to be able to find and reanimate another legendary creature on this turn and not have to worry about phantasmal image, phantasmal image, the same turn to the legend rule both. Sure, I guess in that sense, um, there isn't actually another spell to counter for Kyle. You know, maybe he would hold it to try to counter a spell like post phantasmal image, but you know, Chris can't actually cast anything. Yep. So the days is, you know, the days is kind of a dead card. You know, in a very good way it's a dead card. Yeah. But so maybe what you're weighing there is is it worth it to to stump my mana development two days? That might be the only question that you're asking. So we see, uh, we see that the previous turn, Chris drew the Force of Will, uh, turn too late. In this turn, he uh, drew the Master of the Pearl Trident, um, and he really needs to just hope that the next turn he draws one of his three phantasmal images. Uh, otherwise, this game is going to be over very quickly, and we're going to be going to game three. And so Chris is going to go ahead and... He, he cast a cast relic of progenitor. So yeah. basically, I mean, that will stop the Kyle's plan of making a second creature. Yep. Um, so this this is a fine play. You know, to, he's playing to the top of his deck. Yeah. Does he? And he does not have the phantasmal image in hand. I believe. No, he does not. All right. So in response, Chris is going to entomb. So I think this is one of the reasons where the days would have been good. He could daze right. He, if he had days, he could have dazed right here. Yeah. And have to tap out Chris and never, you know reanimate another creature. Yep, so it, it ends up being relevant because Chris doesn't have a third land and because this particular line comes up. Um, that said, Kyle doesn't have a ton of life to work with here, um, so the second reanimate in his hand is actually not super live. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, as long as he gets something like Sphinx of the Steel Wind, it's probably okay because it'll gain his life. I mean, the, he can be yeah. pretty, he can put his life total pretty low. So. He gets an Elish Norn, um, which you know presumably he's going to use to to wrap uh, a board. And we can't daze here. It's a blue spell. I'm just kidding. Yeah, he has that. Yep. Okay, yeah, it resolves. Brainstorm, brainstorm. Okay, resolving brainstorm. So we have a spell pierce, a show and tell, and a force of will. All these are kind of irrelevant. Actually, I think you know what. Kyle should have gotten something different. He should have gotten an Angel of Despair. If he gets Angel of Despair, he's he can blow able up to the Aether vial. blow up the Aether Vial and close out all of Chris's outs. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you remember that that reanimate doesn't actually... I mean, there's still the Relic of Progenitus, so I'm not sure, you know, with the mana up. Sure. Actually, actually, none of this actually is going to work. Um, I think he's we usually just have hoping that Chris does not draw a Phantasmal Image. Yeah, um, but so the, the line that... Oh, is this all in response to the Relic of Progenitus? Oh, okay, so Relic's still on the stack. He's digging for Force of Will, which he did yeah. hit. And so that the seems very fair. Was, was an effort to reshuffle his library and look for another card. Yeah. He did. Now, to make that play interesting, Kyle did not keep the Reanimate in his hand. He kept the Spell Pierce as his last card in hand. Hmm. But Chris drops a six. So this will be the turn. Can Chris draw Phantasmal Image? I'm not, I'm not sure why. Yeah, the reanimate seems to be a little more robust than the spell pierce here. Yeah. I mean, so we, we were able to counter the relic, which brings back the, if we put the Angel of Despair into the graveyard, we can close out that one. Right. And Chris's draw, not not the not Phantasmal Image. So we're going to game three. Uh, pretty relevant, I think, that the, I think the odds in this game really do change with Chris on the play. Uh, as we saw there, you know, Chris had had a, a second daze, which is only made live when he's on the play. Uh, there's a lot of other cards like Relic of Progenitus that really only turn live, often can only be live when he's on the play. Yep. Um, so we we saw the Relic of Progenitus come in. Uh, 
now that now that Kyle has seen that, um, he's almost certainly going to keep the show and tells in. Um, the question is whether he brings in the pithing needles or not. I still think that he does not want to do that, um, even though they have some additional utility against ether vials. Um, he well, just he could can't. Well, in pithing needles and pithing needle relic of progenitus. That's a you know that that'd be the one reason he he would do that. Yeah. I just, I don't think that you can afford to bring in six different spells. Uh, I would here. agree. Well, what he can do is he can board out some number of his reanimation targets if he's willing, wants to. That's true. Um, you know, the, the Jindicataxius is not particularly useful, um, and the Sphinx of the Steel Wind may not be, may not actually be what you want in this matchup. Um, because so often it's not going to be able to block. Yeah, the worry here is if he boards out too many of his creatures, then his cards, let, you know, cards like Careful Study do become worse, that, since that's one of his engines for uh, getting cards into his graveyard. Yeah, and one of the r sort of rules of thumb that people have used in the past for developing reanimator decks is that you really don't want to go below seven uh, guys that you want to reanimate. Okay, so, so he has eight in the main, so he has shaving one, one is, is an option, um, but two may be too dangerous. So we are shuffling up for game three. Chris is making sure that he's got 60 cards in his deck uh, and his pile shuffling away. Uh, it looks like we have a result from one of the other matches. Our first winner is Brian Hawley, still undefeated. He's playing Bant, has defeated Rug Delver two games to zero in one of our quarterfinal matches. That's an impressive win, but Brian is an impressive player. Uh, he's been moving around. Yeah, sort of the the Northwest and Rocky Mountain area. Yeah, originally from Utah, grinder. and now it's moved up to the Seattle area. Yep. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty used to seeing him at the top tables at PTQs uh, as far afield as Boise and Utah and in Seattle. All right. So, um, yeah, game through. So Chris basically... Um, I think what he's, what he's looking for is probably two forms of disruption for for an opening hand. You know, if he has any, when it comes to, between counter spells and relics, he's probably looking to have two of them in his opener, one of them probably not enough. Yeah, I mean, if he if he opens up a hand with a force and a daze, or one of, you know, a force and a relic of progenitus, he's going to be very happy with his opening hand. Um, he can also probably keep hands with, you know, one piece of disruption and a very aggressive draw. So if he has, for example, a force into a curse catcher, into a lord, into another lord, that could be good enough, um, you know, if he can get enough down before Iona comes on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like we're about ready to present. Kyle is finishing up his shuffling ritual, and Chris is thinking about whether there's something he could have done in that game, and exploring his lines and then saying, I don't think there was. But I'll have to review it. Both these players very serious, playing to continue in the top eight to the semifinals. All right, Chris's opening hand. We've got Mutavolt. We've got a Force of Will. It looks like a standstill. Uh, I'm not sure if I see any islands. I think there's a wasteland in there. No, looks like both both oh, players immediately keeping on seven. Remember this matchup pretty relevant in the first couple turns. Yeah. So we see two careful studies in Kyle's hand. He does have a Gristlebrand in hand as well. So turn one careful study. That's not the spell he's going to fight over. So yeah. he draws Gingitaxis and Show and Tell. So he should be able to put at least one monster in his graveyard and another one in, keep another one in his hand for the Show and Tell. Yeah. And this is, this is actually kind of good news for Chris because uh, by casting careful study instead of Entomb, Kyle's going to have less control over which creature goes into his graveyard. Iona is really backbreaking and is hard to beat um, without a very specific draw. The other, uh, yeah, two other reanimatable creatures are not necessarily unbeatable. So he puts both the Praetors and blue and white Praetors into his yard, passes back the turn, we see a Mutavolt turn two from Chris, and he's going to make standstill. Yeah, this is sort of a classic play of I'm going to go ahead and put a man land into play, yeah. cast standstill, and then hope to beat you while you yeah. are free to break the standstill. It really just is a draw three. Yeah. And careful study, Kyle, yeah, no no concern for the standstill, we're going to immediately let him draw three. He gets a curse catcher and two more lands off it. Curse catcher pretty light. 
Chris is not going to fight over a second Carol oh, study. Two more lands from Kyle. For Kyle. So he has plenty <clears throat> of lands. Uh, he's looking like he's going to discard the Gristlebrand. He has the Iona in his hand as well. Yeah. And it looks like he's got a show and tell in his hand. Yep. Um, so, so he only needs plan, to keep one, one large creature. Yeah, his plan may be to try to exhaust Chris's uh, counter magic with potential reanimation spells if he draws them, and, and then eventually show and tell the Iona into play. Yeah, and a Relic of Bergenet is drawn by Chris, so that'll really put Kyle just on the uh, just on the show and tell plan. Yeah, um, and unfortunately for for Kyle, Chris has you know the Force of Will in his hand, and I think he may have a Daze as well um, as the Curse Catcher. So there's there's a lot of disruption ahead of for him. Kyle's being punished a little bit for playing um, for not for discarding the island and playing the underground sea. Uh, he just opened himself up to getting wastelanded here. He does still have a fetch land in hand so he could have hung on to that in case he needed a black mana. Yeah, he, he may have been trying to optimize for future brainstorms um, and you know figured that the one basic island that he has is going to be enough. Curse catcher for Chris, he leaves up one leaves up the wasteland, he's gonna tap relic to, you know, get the island out of Kyle's deck. And we have a pass of the turn from Chris. Yeah, no, the, the, one of the difficult things here is that Kyle has not forced Chris to play a single counter spell yet. You know, he has a turn three show and tell, and now he does have an animate dead, a, a turn, a little bit of like a turn too late. Yeah, well, so, and he's going to cast the animate dead here, and he's going to get um, the relic of progenitus to, to fire at the very least. And, you know, that's that's better than having it sit there and slowly eat away at all your creatures. Uh, but it is not ideal. And really, he has to use this now. Yep. I mean, there's, yeah. He just has to get get the relic off the table and try to rebuild, putting more things in the yard. Yeah. Unfortunately, having three of his uh, eight different creatures in his graveyard and less in his hand means that his deck doesn't actually have that many more um, to, to put away. So presumably we're we're targeting the Bristlebrand with this animate dead. Uh, and Chris Chris is agonizing over whether he wants to um, use the force of will in his hand, the possible days in his hand. It looks like he has two force of wills in his hand. I know he has a Merfolk Reachery that he can pitch to it. Um, he, he probably is not thinking about using the Curse Catcher here, uh, just to tap out Kyle. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean the Curse Catcher on the Animate Dead? Yeah. Uh, you, you, oh, Curse that's, Catcher can't you cannot. Do that. yeah. It's only instants and sorceries. Yep, so that one's activated. And the Animate Dead, for the record, was targeting Elish Yep. Alright. Uh, so... Animate Dead, will, animate animate dead, dead does hit resolve, the graveyard. And it's going to go to the graveyard. And Chris draws a card. Uh, looks like he drew a Lord of Atlantis for the turn. Right, and you know he doesn't actually have a way to cast Lord of Atlantis yet. He doesn't doesn't have a second blue source, so he has he's a little lacking. Oh no, say it does have a second blue source. I was saying he's a little lacking in a clock. That's not a particular concern right now. Yeah. He does have four, two Force of Wills, two blue creatures, and a Curse Catcher, so he has a lot of permission. He really only needs a nominal clock down. You know, maybe maybe one like, one Lord of Atlantis should be enough to just deal four a turn even. Yep. Um, and so he can he can choose to either attack with the mutable this turn after playing uh, one of his lords. Hmm. You can tap for Mero Leisure and swing for two with first catcher. Yeah. Um, and so the, the decision I was thinking about was whether he plays Lord of Atlantis and chooses to attack with the mutable or whether he chooses to use the wasteland. And I think he's going to use the wasteland here. Now, if he's going to take this line of action, I think he needs to wasteland the underground sea to make sure his curse catcher is live against the show and tell. Um, he's, he's left himself open to having to use a force at this point. And honestly, the, the Lord of Atlantis in his hand are more valuable lords than the Merfolk Reachery that he put in play. So even though he maximized his mana usage by doing this, I think he made a slightly suboptimal play. Yeah. Um, all right, so we see a fetch land from Kyle Hershey. Yeah. Not sure if he drew any disruption for the turn, uh, but, you know, if he... Well, well it's still going to be hard. He's going to have to, you know, just continuing to try to... He's going to have to continue to try to jam show-and-tells, essentially. Yeah. Uh, it, it really won't be until, you know, 
Chris can have let two of you know can counter two of them, so it'll be the third one which will get Kyle the game. Yeah, and so if he, if he drew a thought seize, for example, that would cut down on the number, yep. but he's he's going to need to have two pieces of disruption uh, and a show and the show and tell in his hand, or you know two show and tells and a piece of disruption, or three show and tells. Uh, so things are looking somewhat grim for Kyle here, even though he doesn't know it yet. I mean, and Kyle has to assume that there's some counter magic. Chris hasn't played a single counter spell yet. And, you know, it's unlikely that Chris kept a hand just on the back of Curse Catcher, the Relic of Progenitus. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, what, what choice does he have at this point? Uh, not too much. So yeah. I'm going to go with Curse Catcher. And we'll see Force of Will. Chris choosing to pit, use Force of Will as, you know... Yep, yeah, choosing to use the first Force of Will. Yep. Kyle correctly, you know, playing around the Curse Catcher that's on the board here. Yep. Uh, so Chris is going to get to untap, uh, and unless he draws a blue card, he's not going to cast the Lord of Atlantis, but he does draw a blue card. He drew a phantasm image, actually. Um, hmm, that may... It's possible that that's more valuable than getting another Lord out. Um, I would think that the second, well, the second Lord out would make both his creatures 3-3s, three which yeah. decreases the clock. From, you know, which uh, which takes a turn off the clock because it's 18 damage. It would untap an island, you know, still untap an island. The thing is with two mutavolts in play, if he gets the Lord down this turn, actually, next turn he has lethal. Yeah. So I, I do think he makes the one Lord this turn. Yeah. Um, and definitely would like to wasteland uh, Kyle's underground sea this turn uh, to make sure that Curse Catcher uh, is at least potentially alive. Right. So we see a swing of uh, a swing of nine here, or sorry, of ten. Uh, ten. And we need about being a 4 4. It puts Kyle down to 7. Yeah. Uh, and we're just going to see whether Chris has any more plays for this turn before passing it back. I'd like to see him use the Wasteland at this point. Um, it, even though it doesn't actually cut down Kyle's outs because um, of the Force of Will and because we know that Kyle has another land in hand, it's you know, a good play for Chris because he doesn't know Kyle's hand. Yeah, the Wasteland play does does happen. Uh, Kyle doesn't in tune for the turn and not too much. We get a concession. Uh, Kyle does not draw the out he needs. Chris Morseland wins two games to one over Kyle Hershey and moves into the semifinals. That was an interesting game. Um, un unfortunately, you know, for Kyle, he's not going to be going on past the top eight, but Chris is going to be going into the top four. Uh, he's going to be facing the uh, winner of our other potential feature match, uh, which is David Doburn with Dark Maverick versus Joe Lissette versus Blue White with Blue White Red Miracles. Yeah, 